To those of you who are godly, you were here yesterday. <laughs> but for the rest of you, uh, you did not hear Dr. William Struthers, who is professor of psychology at Wheaton College. He gave uh, yesterday his first talk for the annual WIC lecture series, which is generously funded uh, by an organization which used to be called Women in the Church and the PCA. The more formal lectures um, happen in the evening, and again, they will be happening tonight starting at 6.30 in Brock 120, and they're open to everyone, and that is where he really gets into some fascinating uh, data about neuroscience and sexuality, and just ask any of the students that were there last night, it gets interesting, and it, you'll learn stuff you don't know. Just trust me, just ask them. Uh, as I said, his specialty is neuroscience. His research focused on neural mechanisms that underlie behavioral arousal. That's not on a lot of people's CV, but it's on his. He's a contributor to and author of various publications, but especially for our community, most significantly, a very helpful, thoughtful book called Wired for Intimacy, How Pornography Hijacks the Male Brain. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to spend a semester in California with Bill while we were both visiting research scholars at the Center for Christian Thought. The first time I actually really spent any time with him, we, were room, we roomed together at a retreat. This is at the very beginning. And I just remember, I think I basically kept him up way too late pestering him with questions. And that has really continued because the reality is these are difficult issues that we're talking about. So now, whenever I see Bill, inevitably I will ask uncomfortable, he doesn't really find him uncomfortable, I do, uncomfortable questions that are important, questions about neuroscience, questions about sexuality, questions about how the church should be talking about some of these difficult pressing issues. And I keep asking because I learn from his valuable insights, from his rare ability to both understand the data and to be deeply shaped by cla classic Christian orthodoxy. In my opinion, he has the rare combination of a scientist's mind, a pastor's heart, and a churchman's habits. I think living in such a highly sexualized time, we need help thinking well and faithfully about our sexuality, about our bodies. We need to avoid being tossed around by the trendy winds of our day while also avoiding ill-informed statements that, whether intentionally or unintentionally, hurt people in, the, in our midst whose bodies, whose experiences, and whose struggles may be different than our own. So please w w join me in welcoming Dr. Struthers. Help us think through that. Those of you who know Kelly know he sometimes flatters unnecessarily. Uh, well, uh, thanks for, for allowing me to stick around after yesterday. I wasn't quite sure if I'd be allowed or not. Uh, but my, my hope in the time that we have available uh, to us now is to unpack a little bit of what we, we started last night. But in the event that you weren't here yesterday or you weren't with us last night, uh, I've, I've kind of tentatively titled this, this chapel, Brainy is the New Sexy. And if you are a fan of popular culture, you probably know where that comes from. Uh, any Sherlock fans? Oh, yes. How can you not be a Sherlock fan? Come on, right? This notion that, you know, that, that sexuality is not just about what's between your legs, but is actually what's between your ears is perhaps something that we are uh, beginning to learn. And I, as a, as a neuroscientist, uh, I study the neural mechanisms of, uh, of sexual arousal, especially in mammals, very interested in it. Studied, did my dissertation on it, looking at males and females. Went to teach at Wheaton College and wondered why my students didn't really give a rat's brain about the rat's brain. Well, uh, because you all seem to be much more interested in humans than human sexuality, than rats running around dark cages under red lights being filmed uh, when they've had surgical procedures you know, done on them or drugs injected into their brain. And so uh, my students actually were the ones who challenged me uh, to think about how what I was doing 
was relevant for the world that they were growing up in. Because I started in 1997 at Wheaton, but it was really around 2004, 2005, we started to see more and more of the generation of young people who had grown up with broadband internet access started coming to college. And they would begin to start drifting to my office concerned that they were somehow addicted to pornography. And it uh, was the, the thing that really prompted me to start investigating that, not just because I was uh, you know, uh, interested in, in porn for, for any stretch of the imagination, but because uh, for, for two things. One is it was a fascinating research question. And the second was that when I was at uh, Honey Rock Camp, which is a, a camp that is connected with our college, yeah, maybe some people know that, um, okay. Um, I, I remember sitting out looking over, over the lake, and, and, and I know sometimes people talk about, you know, hearing the voice of God. Uh, as I was looking out over the lake, the lake, just sort of meditating, I heard the voice of God, and it was perhaps the clearest I have ever heard the voice of God, and it terrified me. It terrified me. And God spoke to me and said, I need you to do this for the church, and, and research this, write this book to help people understand. And so I did, and that's the book that, that, that Kelly mentioned. But, um, but what I'd like to do is, because that was a handful of years ago, is to maybe reframe some of the things that I wrote in the book and give you, uh, I'm going to show you a pornographic image here next. And so I just want you to kind of bear with me. I didn't seek approval from the chaplain's office prior to doing this, so just, you know, it's going to be okay. But this image actually does a great job of explaining the, kind of the, 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 the sinister effects of pornography. You guys ready? Okay. Wait a minute, what? Oh, okay. Remember the dress? You know, you know, internet, you know, viral things kind of come and go. But I was at home one night, and I started getting a bunch of email messages like, Dr. Struthers, can you explain the dress to me? Like, what are you talking about? Then, you know, hey, dude, did you see this? What is this? And I'm looking, I'm like, it's a white dress. What do I need to... I'm like, hey, Donna, do you know what this is? She's like, yeah, it's a blue and black dress. <laughs> what? It's white. It's gold. No, it's... What are you, what are you talking about? And we, we start we're looking at my phone, and we're staring at this dress, and I'm like, that's white and gold. How do you not see that as white and gold? She's like, it's blue and black. What are you talking about? And so as a brain scientist, for me, this was like, oh my goodness, I'm relevant now. <laughs> I can actually go to my students and like say, hey, we know what's going on here. This is, if, if you're not familiar with this, this is actually not the original picture. This is actually two pictures that have been tweaked so that if you saw the black and blue, you could see it as white and gold, or if you saw the white and gold, you would see it as black and blue. And so when we look at kind of this, this question, like what's going on here, there are a number of uh, perceptual principles. There are a number of what we might call neurobiological realities about how we perceive things. We perceive colors as, in fact, being constant, right? That they're not changing, that the color of the shirt is, in fact, the same color here as it is, oh, when I go back into the shadows back here, right? That it's not that the shirt isn't changing, but the luminance is actually changing. And so we, 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 I'm not wearing a chameleon shirt, right, that kind of changes colors depending on where I'm at. Like if I move over here, there'll be some pigments that will change. We don't have that tech yet, but it will be cool, and I will buy it when it happens. So we, we assume that there's, there's, these things are constant. And we also you notice, is, is, that a, is that someone wearing that dress? We don't see a head. We don't see legs. We don't see arms. But conceivably, it could be a person wearing it, right? Or it could be on a hanger, or it could be on a mannequin. And so it's, you know, the, the boundaries sort of limit our ability to get the bigger picture. And sometimes when you narrow the boundaries, it can affect how you perceive things. White balance, that's the thing that makes the, the difference here, uh, which is you, you notice there on the far right, I think, if I notice you can see there should be a little bit of color up in here that sort of pops in and out because we can bleach out the background by amping up the white balance. That can be, that's kind of how we get this back and forth. But remember, this was first a, a picture. This was something that was real, that was put through a medium, and then transmitted. And so I wasn't really looking at the dress. 
I was looking at a picture of the dress. It's a little different. It was a representation of it. But my wife and I were looking at the same thing. You see, our neurological histories, our own perceptual experiences and our own perceptual limitations influenced us so that I couldn't see the black and blue and she couldn't see the white and gold. And so our, our, even under the same conditions, we were seeing very, very different things. We were seeing the same thing in very, very different ways. And I want to argue that perhaps there is a, you know, there's something to, you know, there, there's a gendered component to this. If you look at the research on the dress, you'd see that men tend to view it in one set of colors, women tend to view it in another set of colors. But there's also an age component to it as well. Older individuals tend to see it as one set of colors and others as a second set of colors. So there are developmental components, there's gendered components to this. And perhaps we are living in a world now where we have an entire generation of young people who have been raised in a hyper-sexualized culture that see the dress as white and gold, and perhaps there are older individuals from previous generations who see the dress as, in fact, black and blue. Now, this is a fascinating question for me because, uh, as I mentioned, you know, it started off as young men who started coming to my office. And, 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 and I write about this a bit in my book. Maybe there is something about the neurological way that men, on average, not everyone, but, but on average, tend to be attracted to these kinds of images at a particular season of their life, right? The naked female form to a, uh, a four-day-old means it's time to nurse, right? The breast means food. To a four-year-old, the naked female form means mom doesn't have any clothes on. To the 14-year-old, it, it generates arousal, but it's sort of a diffuse anxiety in arousal. But to the 24-year-old who has been exposed, these are men, who are just sort of surfing uh, internet pornography as their faces are being illuminated from the monitors from the laptop. What we find is that when this becomes your pattern, perhaps you are not, you know, gay, straight, lesbian, I mentioned this on, uh, you know, yesterday, perhaps we're seeing a whole orientation towards pornography, that you are pornosexual rather than human-oriented. And so uh, you see uh, Davy Rothbard has written an article in New York Magazine back in 2011, wow, five years ago, that men just aren't in, many young men are just not into real people. So we think about the nature of consumption, and I'm very, very interested in looking at what happens when you put people in brain scanning technolo you know, technologies and look at their responsiveness to sexually explicit imagery. This is actually some of the earlier studies that were done because they were pretty confident that naked people would get people's attention like we needed the brain scientists to tell us that. And they compared it to, you know, pictures of you know, the, the, the beautiful mountainside, or a picture of a plant next to a bookcase, or a picture of a dog. Oh, dogs kind of get us feeling kind of nice and fuzzy, unless you're a cat person, right? Then they make you angry. They turn on the anger center in your brain. But what we do know is that, boy, we, we can look at what's going on neurologically inside us when we become sexually aroused. We can look at what happens when we put males and females and give them the same, same images. Over here we have the males, and over here we have females. Yellow being higher levels of excitation. What we've got is a ton of amygdaloid activity bilaterally in men, and an awful lot of ventral tegmental activity, mesolimbic activity. You guys don't know what that means, but that's okay. And when you contrast that with females, you see, wow, females, you get it more on the right side, less so on the left, and you get in your absence of this, and you see, wow, look at the, the cortical activity here. Wow, we get a ton of cortical cerebellar activity in, in males, and you contrast that with females, and people said, oh, look, see, we've got neurological evidence now that men like to look at porno pornography. Once again, like we needed that data to tell us that. We have lots of cross-cultural data that tells us that. We have economic and social data that tell us this. So this is just one more element to our understanding of, 
okay, this in fact is real. And we know that these regions here are significant players in substance abuse, drug addiction. And so people said, wow, maybe like pornography's, pornography's like heroin for your eyes. It's like crack cocaine that you're kind of pooling into your, your retina. And, and I would like to argue that that's a wrong way of thinking about sex as a type of drug. Sex is sex. It's natural. It's what we're designed for. It's what we're made for. We're not designed for heroin. Heroin is like smoke-distilled injected orgasm. That's, what, that's a better way to talk about heroin than to use, let's talk about sex as it is sex, right? And so when we think about the, even the language that we use in our culture, that we become addicted to pornography. Well, that's, that's a wrong way of thinking about it. Maybe pornography is like a supranormal stimulus. We could not get... Well, let, let, well we, we could, actually. If we had everyone, and I'm going to get weird on you for a second, so just hang in there. If everyone in this room got naked right now, you would be able to see hundreds of naked bodies. That doesn't happen a whole lot in the real world, does it? No, it doesn't. But it can happen on a screen. You can go through thousands of naked bodies in 20 minutes. You are not made for that. It is a type of stimuli that, if we actually did have naked people in this room, it would be weird because we'd be kind of smelly and we might bump up against each other and our skin might actually touch, right? And there'd be a whole, there's like a whole social thing going on. But in the privacy of your own room, where no one else is around, you have access to the, not the tactile, not the olfactory, but the visual and the auditory signals that come when you are voyeuring into someone else's sacred, sexual, intimate moments. They may not consider them sacred. They don't. That's why they were you know, more than happy to put them up online. But you can take that in in a way that you were never meant to. And that will disrupt the way that we are made. It will disrupt the way that we think about our sexuality. Another interesting study. I can, I can mentally violate you right now. I'm going to mentally violate you. Ready? I'm going to make you move without making you move. Here we go. One, two, three. I, I just violated you. What? Well, well, I mean, did you feel violated? No. But I actually pushed myself into your brain just now just by raising my hand. We have what are called mirror neuron systems. That when you see me do this, you know how to do this. Okay? I'm, well, maybe violation was the wrong word to use, right? I'm going to manipulate you. I'm going to make you dance. Can you do that on campus? Can you guys dance? <laughs> we weren't allowed to at Wheaton for a long time. We can now. It just has to be square dancing. <laughs> or swing dancing. I guess we can do that too. All right, so here we go. I'm going to make you dance. Ready? One, two, three. Right. That's not dancing. What do you mean, Kelly? That's, that's my dancing. Okay. Hold on a second. Okay? See, when you see someone do something, even though you don't do it, neurologically, you vicariously experience what they do. And that's a great thing. That's a wonderful thing. It's how we learn. But when you are watching pornography, you are vicariously participating in the experience. And that, in, in many ways, is part of its pull. Because as you participate in someone else's sexual act, right, you voyeur into that, you neurologically experience part of what they experience. And what happens if you're watching something, and then, whoa, that, I wasn't expecting that. I, don't, I didn't like that. Whoa, I just thought this was just going to be kind of just, you know, something tame, but where did that come from? Or that person shouldn't be in here. See, just by seeing something, you expose yourself, and now neurologically, you are now predisposed to maybe not doing it, but knowing how you could do it. 
and it can become a part of your fantasy life. And so we think about, you know, children who are exposed to materials unintentionally. In many ways, it's as, it's as if the screen is violating them neurologically. That should terrify you. It terrifies me. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Where the Father up above, looking down in disgust, damnation, disapproval. Ooh, no, that's not the gospel. But we should actually think about, you know, our Father looks down in love on us, and even in our own failings when we fail, when we look when we shouldn't. He still loves us. But those things get into us, and I would argue they get into us, and neurologically, they shape us. They shape us so much, and here's some more. I mean, we can actually look at these mirror neuron systems, and I can show you where all these are. Come tonight, we're going to go into a lot more detail on this. But you don't just look at something as a passive observer. You look at something, and it shapes the way you see it the next time. You look at something, and you find that it activates different parts of you, temporal lobe activity. By the way, temporal lobe, lobe activity is also closely associated with spirituality. Sexuality and spirituality occupy the same cortical regions. They're neighbors. And so we think about how this may play itself out. Some of the research that we do looks at, well, why do men and women now look at pornography? And what we find is that it, there's many reasons why. It's not just because they're perverts. Sometimes it's because their sexuality is incredibly warped and perverted. But, of, but most of the time we find people look at pornographic material because it's a way that they can medicate something. Medicate the stress. Medicate the, the anxiety. Medicate the rejection. Medicate the depression that they experience in their lives. Medicate the boredom. And so we find that there are you know, any number of ways we can examine this. I'm very interested in looking at impulsive individuals, so people who you know, aren't compulsive, who would say that they're addicted, but people who would just say, hey, yeah, you know, I saw a picture of you know, this particular person, and I wondered what they would look like naked. So I just you know, went and I Googled them to see if I could find something. That's an impulsive type. You, know, you wouldn't treat someone with obsessive compulsive disorder the same way you did someone with attention deficit disorder. Would you? And so proper understanding what is this doing is what we're really, we're really interested in. Come tonight, I'll, I'll unpack this a little bit more. We know now, uh, and, and you know, when we first started writing about this and publishing this, people said, oh, that's not real. That's just some religious moralist, you know, trying to scare people. No, this is Cambridge University, you know, uh, Valerie Boone uh, and, and her crew over there. I remember I, I was actually over at Cambridge when this was released. And, you know, it had all kinds of people asking me about it. Uh, we know that this is just from a general population study. They did what we might call a cattle call. They just said, hey, people from the community, come in. We want to scan your brains. And people from the community came in, and they filled out all of these different surveys. And one was a pornography uh, consumption survey. How much pornography do you view? And what they found was that there were a number of regions of the brain that were affected or maybe technically correlated with how much pornography you viewed. The more pornography you viewed, the more these circuits atrophied. The more these brain regions shrunk. Now, well, if it's correlation, right? Maybe it's the other direction. Oh, great. So either porn is shrinking your brain or people with shrunken brains are more vulnerable to view pornography. Which one did you prefer? I think they're both kind of bad. Wow, correlation doesn't equal causation. Capital news, right? So technically smoking doesn't cause can lung cancer, so just carry on. Well, perhaps we need to kind of stop and rethink this research. And I would like to offer, and we'll unpack a bit more tonight, that maybe growing up in a, porno uh, a pornified culture has shaped the way we think about sexuality. That pornography creates a way of thinking about sex as a commodity, as a moment, as just a package. That you don't see what goes on out. You only see the edge of the screen. You don't see the, camera, the cameramen, you know, the people who are recording the audio, the directors who are shouting instructions, right? You don't see that. 
So the boundaries are different. It's, it's produced material, right? You got makeup, and I mean, that's a whole thing online. You know, porn stars without their makeup on look very, very different. So think about the way that it is produced and then pixelated and distributed and being able to consume it. I don't have my phone on me, but I could grab one of your phones and probably get some porn on it in 10 seconds. Easy. HD quality stuff, too. You guys didn't need me to tell you that. You know it. And so how does this create a, a narrative where we think about sexuality as a commodity and the way that we think about I mean, we've seen these things, so I guess they're okay. Well, I'd like to kind of leave you with a couple of thoughts. In the absence of a good Christian theology of the body and of sexuality, and I think most of the, the, actually the active understandings of the body and sexuality in the majority of Christian churches is pretty vapid. It's not very deep. I talked about it yesterday. It's don't do it before you get married. Don't get a disease. Don't get pregnant unless you want to, and don't violate anyone. That's, kind of, that's a vapid theology. Those rules are good, good rules, but they're, they're, they're hollow by themselves. When we think about the culture, is we talk about the sex industry, like sex is work. Like it can be something that we can put a price tag on. That, that's something that we have just sort of embraced. And so what we, we end up with is, I would like to argue, a way of perceiving the world that is in fact very, very misleading. I think what happens is that in the, the place that many of us sit, and I would put myself among it as well, we have a very poor understanding of the gospel as nothing more than just my way of making sure I don't spend eternity in hell. And it is much richer than that. It is much richer than that. And so we, we're left with a, a, a hermeneutic that we read the scriptures and these sexual instructions in such a rigid, legalistic way that what we end up with is a form of oppression. That if I have impulses that fit outside of this particular set of rules, oh my goodness, it's oppressive. Or we go to the other end and say, nah, it's all good. It's all good, don't worry about it. What, you know, don't worry. And so you end up with license, which means there's, it's kind of, once again, I'd argue, it's a very insipid way of thinking about your, your sexuality. It's not challenging at all. I think the gospel becomes our filter. And if we are trained in such a way, we might look at that cross and say, oh, well, maybe, huh. The cross is a little bit different color. Huh. But some people see it like this. Others see it like this. Some traditions see it like this. Others, maybe like this. Maybe there's a better way, actually, to see the cross. There's a better way to think about sexuality. And I'll be honest. That dress is black and blue. I see it as white and gold. I can't see it as black and blue. I'll give you another little hint as well. Kind of back up here. I suffer from what's called protonopia. That's a red light there. How many of you guys see the red light? I don't see red. Sorry, don't see it. However, when I come to a stop sign and that top light is lit, guess what I do? I stop. Even though it's not my experience, I trust that there's something beyond what I can see, and I change the way I live in accordance with that. I may never see the reds until I get a resurrected body and I get the right pigments in that retina, you know, in that resurrected body. But I don't just say, screw it, it's not red. Red doesn't exist. Y'all are lying to me. Boom, and I go straight through. Because <laughs> if I did that, boom! Whoa. I'm going to get hurt. And not only am I going to get hurt, someone else is coming through and I get them. We have to trust that even though we can't see the gospel, we can't see the green of the cross, maybe we only see the blue, we only see the white, that maybe there's something deeper there and we can live our lives in such a way to acknowledge a reality beyond what we perceive. That's what I want to unpack a bit tonight. Thanks, by the way, for sitting, you know, for these last couple of days uh, in, in chapel. But I think... Let's stop and reflect a bit on this, shall we? And then let me pray for you guys and send you out. Heavenly Father, we, we, we know our own experience. We know the longings that come 
we know the, the desire that is stirred up within us. We feel that. Lord, we are made to know communion with one another. We are made for communion with you. And Lord, you give us guidance on how to, to bless one another by honoring boundaries. You give us a melody of what love looks like, a, a love that is not just self-indulgent that we might experience our own flourishing, but one that I pray we would be singing a melody of faithfulness, knowing that some will have the chance to embrace uh, an experience that is filled with blessings and joy, and others, out of their faithfulness, like the martyrs, experience pain. But may we honor the obedience of those, of those who would sing the song of faithfulness, of those who would not trust in their own perception, but actually trust that your word is true. Help us show compassion to those who may not be able to see the red. And may we not become arrogant in our ability to see the colors that others do not. But may we show charity. May we show grace, knowing that you do look down on us in love. That we should be wise about what we do. And that we should understand that the things that are outside of our control maybe have shaped us. But our decisions shape us as well. Your spirit can shape us. Your word can shape us if we are open to participating in the sanctification of our souls. Heavenly Father, uh, look down on these, these women and men in love. Bless them this day. Give them grace. Give them insight. Give them new ways of thinking about your gospel. And may they continue to delve deeper into depths that they have not yet experienced. Depths that show who you truly are. Watch over them, I pray. And I ask these things in your name, Lord Christ. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Walk in the light. <laughs>